This time, I would like to welcome our presenters for tonight. So joining us tonight for the Revive presentation is Ms. Mallory McKnight. She is the Substance Abuse Specialist here in Prince William County Schools. In joining her, we also have Ms. Heather Martinson. She is the Senior Supervisor for Wellness and Prevention here in Prince William County Government. Ladies, welcome. Thanks, Jeanette. I'm going to share my screen. Good evening. Um, All right. Good evening, everyone. So again, my name is Mallory McKnight. I'm the Substance Abuse Prevention Specialist in the Student Health and Wellness Department. And I will let Heather introduce herself. Good evening, Heather Martinson. Um, title has changed since the slides. Um, wellness and Prevention Manager with Prince William County Community Services, otherwise known as CSB. Thank you, Heather. Um, so before we get into the revive portion of this presentation, I just wanted to make you all aware of just some of the trends that are of concern for adolescents um, as it relates to substance abuse. So some of the things that are of concern is the availability of fentanyl um, that is in a lot of the drug supply that's currently being sold. So we'll touch on that, especially getting into that revived portion of the presentation. Um, another concern that we have for teens and other adolescents are is poly drug use. So using more than one substance at a time. So when, when someone is using more than one substance, of course it can enhance the effects that a person may feel. Um, it can also, it can also lead to an increased risk of things like overdose. So that is definitely a concern that we have for young people. Vaping over the last couple of years has been increasing, especially for the youth population. So vaping is, if you're not aware, electronic cigarette use. So whether vaping nicotine or THC, which is found in cannabis, or vaping other type of substances that are just being sold on the market right now, that is a huge concern for, I would say all age groups um, across the country. Along with that is the, con the high concentration of THC. So THC is what causes the psychoactive effects when people use cannabis. Um, the amount, the high concentration of THC is a concern because it can lead to effects that a person may not be expecting when they're using cannabis. So we'll talk about that on the next couple of slides. Um, there are a lot of counterfeit pills being sold on the street right now, and a lot of it is being laced with fentanyl. So that is a huge concern. So these are um, medications that look like pharmaceutical medication, like um, Percocets, Xanax, Adderall, that are being pressed to look like those pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical medications, but they are actually fakes. And again, a lot of that is being laced with fentanyl. And so if you're not aware, fentanyl is a type of an opioid um, that is highly addictive, very dangerous. And so we'll talk a little bit about that throughout the presentation tonight. Um, another concern that we have when it comes to young people is the rise in teen drug overdose deaths in recent years. So if you look at this graph, you'll kind of see how it has progressed since 2010. So previously, you know, it was a concern, but we have seen it, especially post COVID world, um, the number of teen overdose deaths increased. Um, so between 2019 and 2020, overdose mortality increased by 94%. And then in 2020, 2021, by 20%. Um, in 2021, 
fentanyl was identified in 77% of adolescent overdose deaths. So again, um, the concern that we have around fentanyl being laced into a lot of the drug supply that is out there right now is a huge concern because it does increase the risk of things like overdoses and sometimes those overdoses are fatal. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, cannabis, you know, at this time, we hear about the legalization of cannabis. We hear that, you know, it's being used for medical reasons and all of these different things. Um, cannabis is not the same cannabis of the 60s. So in the 60s, the average amount of THC, so again, THC is what causes the high when people use cannabis. Um, the average amount of THC that was in cannabis at that time was less than 2%. Um, in the 90s, it rose to about 4%. Today's cannabis has anywhere between 17% THC and 28% THC. So we have dramatically increased um, when it comes to the, the amount of THC that is in cannabis. Um, this causes, you know, it's way more potent. Um, it does cause a lot, a lot more concerns when we're talking about, especially young people being under the influence. Um, and this is just, I would say like herbal forms of cannabis, high grade cannabis that's being sold on the street. There are also things like cannabis extracts, or you may have heard terms like wax, shatter, butter that are hot, like pretty much the THC being extracted from the plant and being sold in very, very high doses. And that can range anywhere between 40% THC and 80% THC. And I think the highest that I've heard about in Colorado was somewhere around like 99% THC. So these are things that young people have access to when we think about the developing teenage brain and what that means for someone whose brain is not finished developing and the effects that it would have on a young person is really, really concerning. So along with, you know, while we're talking about THC, um, it can be used in a lot of different ways. It can be used in the plant form where a person would be burning it and inhaling from it. Um, it is sold in vapes and other vape products. It can also be um, used by consuming it orally. So tea, so beverages, cookies, chips, other food items, it can be sold in that form as well. So this is just the, these are just a couple of pictures of things that are being sold. These look very similar to, you know, food items that are sold at the grocery store. Um, so things like Ruffles chips, Doritos, Sour Patch Kids, um, of course, these are not being sold just to because I've had questions in the past. These are not being sold at the grocery store. These are items that are that um, do have THC in them and are sold on the Internet, on social media, on the street. And so being aware of the types of things that are being sold can kind of help with prevention and the conversations that you all have with the young people in your lives. One of the things to keep in mind when someone is using cannabis in this form where they're eating it or th they're drinking it, um, it takes a lot longer for the person to feel the effects of it. So if someone smokes it, typically maybe within 30 minutes to an hour, the person will feel the effects of the THC. When it comes to eating it, um, it takes a lot longer to process in the body. So it may, it may take longer than an hour for the person to feel the effects. The issue with this is that a person can, you know, let's say have one chip and that is the serving size. If they don't feel it within the hour, they may say, oh, well, I don't feel the effects. Let me have another chip. Oh, I don't have, I still don't feel it. Let me have another chip. And so things like that can lead to things like overdose. And just to, you know, for anyone that may not be aware, a person can absolutely overdose on cannabis. So it's, that is one thing to keep in mind is that because of the route, it may take a lot longer for the person to feel the effects, but because they don't think that it's working, they can consume way too much and it can lead to things like overdose. Um, in Virginia, for people that are over the age of 21, cannabis is legal. Um, and so 
with that being said, I will always encourage, you know, family members, parents, if that is something that is in the home to make sure that it is being locked up um, and kept away from the children in the home. Um, because again, some of this looks like everyday food items. A young person very well may just think that these are chips or candy and, you know, have access to it and it can lead to, you know, possibly going to the emergency room or whatever the case may be. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Heather, who is going to do the revived training portion of the presentation. Yeah, I believe Heather lost internet oh. access because I don't see her on the... Okay. Okay. She'll probably try to log back on, um, mm -hmm. but I will take over until she comes back as best as I can. I usually don't do the revive portion, so please bear with me um, as we get through this content. Um, just to let you guys this, know, just really briefly, Ms. Martinson was the presenter for this portion, but she's having uh, internet connectivity issues at her home. And so Ms. McKnight is going to do the best that she can on this portion until Ms. Martinson is able to log back on. Thank you. So um, this is just kind of giving you an overview of the past several years of um, fatal opioid overdoses. So as you can see, over the past couple of years, overdose, overdoses related to opioids has increased dramatically. Um, and again, one of the main reasons being because of the fentanyl that's being laced into a lot of these products. So some people are knowingly going after fentanyl. Sometimes people are thinking that, oh, this is just Xanax that I bought off the street, or this is just Percocet that I bought off the street but much of it is being laced with fentanyl. And so fentanyl is 50 times, um, 50, 50 times more, more potent than heroin. So that kind of gives you an idea of how strong it is and why it can you know, lead to things like overdoses. Um, in recent years, the, there has been the Virginia Good Samaritan law and they have updated it to include um, if you are a person that is trying to do a, you know, trying to help someone that is experiencing an overdose in good faith, then you, huh? is that me? Um, then you are covered by the law um, to not, for it to not result in any type of Leave, you know, legal issues. So if, again, if you are helping someone that is experiencing an overdose, then you are covered by the Virginia Good Samaritan law. Also, it's important to, to understand that if there is a situation where an overdose has occurred, if you are calling emergency services for help with this overdose, they're not coming to you know, enforce the law necessarily. So they're not coming, if you're trying to save someone, they are not coming to arrest people. So there is there are safe reporting laws when it comes to overdoses, because the main thing that we want to make sure is that, the main thing that we want to make sure of is that when there are overdoses occurring, people aren't scared to call for emergency services because they fear um, some type of, you know, arrest or anything like that. So say, there is safe reporting of overdoses. Um, there is a standing order. So naloxone is accessible at local pharmacies. You do not need a prescription in order to get it. Um, you can go to your local health department. Heather is the one that usually does the, these presentations, but if you go to the Prince William County Community Services, they will give you Narcan for free. Um, so it is accessible everywhere. You do not need a doctor's prescription in order to um, obtain Narcan. So it's really important before we jump into how do we respond to overdose emergencies, it's important to understand addiction. So people don't plan to get addicted. Most of the times, you know, it may start with experimentation and then that may lead to, you know, some sort of dependency. And so we can spend all day talking about how addiction happens, 
But it's just important to understand that most people do not plan for addiction to happen. And so there has to be some type of, you know, some some type of empathy and compassion when it comes to addiction. Because a lot of times I think, you know, mental health is stigmatized sometimes, but when it comes to substance use, that is definitely stigmatized a lot of times. And we kind of, you know, have to change our perspective when it comes to that. People that are addicted, sometimes they may be the in the point at the point where they are looking for support, they are looking for resources, they are looking to recover. Um, and then sometimes they may not be at that point. But it is always important to, you know, try to be understanding and support those that may, you know, be over trying to overcome an addiction. So what is an opioid? So opioids are medications or drugs that pretty much take away pain. So I always explain when I do presentations with students, even though we have medications like Tylenol or Advil that help with pain reduction, those are not the medications that we're talking about. Um, we're talking about pharmaceutical pain medications like Percocets, oxycodone, oxycotton, um, fentanyl. So there is pharmaceutical use for fentanyl. Um, and then there is the fentanyl that's being sold on the street, um, which is the, being illegal, illegally manufactured. And then heroin is also another type of opioid. And so this slide kind of gives us an overview of different street names, um, different types of opioids that there are. It's always important to kind of keep in mind, like terminology changes. And so while, you know, hydro or schoolboy or blue heaven, like maybe some of those terms are used um, to reference different opioids. It's more it's more important to understand how opioids work, um, be familiar with the fact that there is, there is different street terminology to describe it. Um, there's even like, there's a something, the DEA puts out these emoji decoders because a lot of times people will communicate drug use by the use of emojis. And so the DEA came out with this emoji decoder, de decoder um, to kind of explain how, you know, this emoji means this type of drug. And even with things like that, it's important not to get caught up because as soon as you think you've learned a new terminology or a new emoji to describe a drug, then it, it has changed. But just more so to be aware of the different things that are being sold on the street and that there are street terms for it. So what happens when there is an opioid overdose? So this is a good picture to kind of describe what happens in the brain. So you have these, op these opioid receptors in the brain. When the opioids enter your brain, it kind of spits onto that opioid receptor in the brain. And so you'll see this again, um, just to kind of demonstrate how Narcan reverses the overdose. Um, I'll take a moment just to get a pulse. I don't know if we'll get any answers in the chat today, but what do you think are some risk factors that can make someone more likely to, an ex to experience an overdose? So if you want to take, you know, 10 seconds to just put it in the chat really quick, what you think some risk factors are that can make someone more likely to experience an overdose, um, that would be great. If not, we'll just keep on rolling. All right, I don't see anything in the chat right now. Um, but different risk factors. If a person has had a prior overdose, that can make them more likely to experience another uh, over opioid overdose in the future. Um, reduced tolerance. So previous users who have stopped using due to abstinence, illness, treatment, or incarceration, um, they may be more likely to experience an opioid overdose. Mixing drugs. So I think I talked about you know, in the beginning of this presentation, how it can en enhance the effects of a drug um, when you're starting to mix different things. 
Because if you're mixing a depressant with a stimulant, that's going to have one type of effect. Or if you even have two depressants, how, you know, how that interacts in the body and can lead to things like um, opioid overdoses. Um, using a loan. So we started to see this huge increase during the pandemic, um, just because people, you know, just because we were locked in the house did not mean that people that were already going through addiction just stopped using drugs. Of course, they continue to use drugs, but when you're using a loan um, and you do experience an overdose, there's no one else there to, you know, help you reverse that overdose. So that is an increased risk. Um, variations in strength or quantity or changing formulations, um, different medical conditions such as chronic lung disease, kidney or liver problems. These can be, um, these people can be at higher risk for opioid overdoses. How can you tell the difference between someone who is high and someone who has overdosed? The biggest takeaway is whether they are responsive and whether they are breathing. Um, someone that's really high, their muscles become relaxed, their speech may be slurred, but they're still talking, um, sleeping, sleepy looking, nodding out. Um, they are still responsive to things like shouting or the sternal rub. Someone that is going through an overdose, they're not gonna be responsive at all. They may be very pale or clammy. Um, Again, the breathing has completely stopped or they're breathing infrequently. There is something called the death rattle where it is like a deep snoring noise that a person you know, may start to do. That is a big indicator that a person may be overdosing. Um, slow or no heart rate, heart rate. But again, the biggest thing is gonna be whether that person is responsive um, and whether they are breathing or not. That is the biggest tell all to know, you know, if a person is actually overdosing. What are some myths that you've heard about um, ways to reverse an opioid overdose? And I'm just gonna go ahead to the next, to the next slide to kind of talk about what some of those myths are. And some of these myths we've heard when it comes to drinking alcohol. How do you think, you know, some people, try different things when someone is extremely intoxicated. Some of those things may be put that person in a cold bath. We do not do that when someone is overdosing um, because they could actually drown. Do not induce vomiting. So sometimes people think like if you vomit, then you know the intoxication will go away. If you are inducing vomiting for somebody that is going through an overdose, they can actually choke on that vomit. Um, and we absolutely don't want that. Don't put, do not put people in an ice bath. So sometimes people think, oh, just wake them up, put them in a cold shower, put them in an ice bath. That's not what we want to do because the person can actually go into shock and we don't, of course, we don't want that. Um, do not try and stimulate the individual in any way that could cause harm. So we're not slapping the person. We're not kicking them. We're not being aggressive with them. Um, don't inject them. Now, I before doing this training, I've never heard of injecting people with salt water or milk, but I guess it's a thing. So we don't want to inject them with any type of substance, any type of milk, any type of water to try to get them to reverse that overdose. None of these things work. None of these things really even work for if someone has uh, is intoxicated because they were drinking too much. Naloxone, or what we also know as Narcan, is the only effective response to an opioid overdose emergency. So Narcan is the only way to effectively reverse um, an overdose. So what is Naloxone? Naloxone is a medication designed to rapidly reverse opioid overdoses. Um, it is it is used as a nasal spray, or it can be used as an injection. At this point, most of what is being given away, I don't even know if they still do the injections, maybe they do, but we're gonna focus on the nasal spray, um, not the injection. Because most of the time, if you're going to a pharmacy, if you're going to the CSB or the local health department, they are gonna give you the nasal spray. So how naloxone works, I told you all you would see this picture again. So again, you have the opioid receptor 
when someone is using an opioid, that that opioid kind of sits perfectly on that opioid receptor. What naloxone does is knocks that opioid off of the receptor to try to reverse um, the overdose. So naloxone has a stronger affinity to the opioid receptors than the opioids. So it knocks the opioid off the receptors for a short time. And it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, Narcan is for immediate response. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it is effective for a short time span. So between 30 and 90 minutes, and it helps the person to breathe again. So again, we're gonna focus on the Narcan nasal spray. So this is the box that it comes in. Again, if you are interested in getting your own box of Narcan, um, Heather would have shared this, but she has not logged back on yet, but Narcan is given away by the, um, by the CSB. They will give you this box. Each box has two Narcan sprays in it. So you would pretty much peel it, um, place it in the person's nose, and then press the plunger, but we'll go through each of these steps. Um, how to store naloxone, it's the same way you would store any, any other type of nasal spray. So you don't wanna keep it in extremely cold climates or extremely warm climates. Um, it has a shelf life of about three years. So you wanna make sure that you check the label to make sure that your Narcan is not expired. Even if you have Narcan that is expired, if someone experiences an overdose, you still want to administer that expired Narcan because it still probably will work. Just like when, you know, your cough and cold medicine expires, it still can help. Um, but even if you if you have expired Narcan and you you see that before, you know, an overdose happens. You can always go back to the CSB and say, hey, my Narcan is expired and they will give you um, they will give you a replacement Narcan. So Narcan or naloxone is fairly safe. Um, there are no side effects. So even if a person, you know, you think that they're overdosing and they're actually not and you give it to them, there are no real known side effects of that. It is not going to harm the person in any way. Yes. One of a question actually came uh, in the chat. It came to me. Um, the person is asking if when you spray the spray, is it going to be in both nostrils or just one? It works in one nostril. So when you spray it, and I think we, I think there's a slide on that, but when you do spray it, it goes in the one nostril and that that's good. We're good to go. Cause once you spray it, that is all, there's only one dose in that nasal spray. So once you push that plunger, it's gone. So just one nostril. Um, Narcan will not reverse overdoses from other drugs. And so it's important to understand that as well. So if a person has overdosed on, let's say cocaine, that is not an opioid and it would not work on that cocaine, but you still want to administer the Narcan because like I said before, a lot of the drug supply that's being sold on the street is being laced with fentanyl. And you know this is what causes a lot of the overdoses that we're seeing today. So you still wanna administer it because if that person you know, has taken something that is also laced with fentanyl, it still will reverse the effects of that that laced fentanyl. So it's always worth a try. And again, it does not harm, it does not harm the person if, um, I saw Heather, but I think she got kicked back out. Um, it does not harm the person if you give it to them and, you know, it's a different type of drug or, um, I forgot the other part, but I was going to say, but yes, you should still give it to them. So these are the steps that we're gonna focus on. This kind of gives an overview in the next couple of slides, we'll kind of break this down. Steps to respond to an opioid overdose. Number one, you're gonna check for responsiveness. Number two, we're calling 911. And if anyone on this call is already trained in CPR, a lot of this is gonna be a, a refresher for you because a lot of these steps are the same steps from CPR. Um, you're going to give two rescue breaths if the person is not breathing. You're going to administer the naloxone and then continue the rescue breaths. And as you're doing this, you're always assessing and responding to that 
Narcan administration. If you, well, I guess I'll save that for the next couple of slides because we'll go into it in um, more detail. So number one, we're checking for responsiveness. If you call the person's name and they are not responding, that is a problem. One of the ways that um, Revive tries to teach you is to do the sternum rub. So it's pretty much balling your, your fist up and then rubbing your fist on the sternum. Usually if a person you know is responsive, they will respond to the sternum rub because that's not very comfortable. Um, but if they are not responding to the tap on the shoulder, you call in their name, the sternum rub, um, you are gonna check for breathing. If these things are not working, you're not getting a response, you quickly want to move on to the next step, which is to call 911. So again, even if you use Narcan, it's a short-term solution. Um, it'll be effective for anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes. So the, the goal with Narcan is to always call 911 to make sure that someone is on their way um, and then administer the Narcan. So someone is there to treat them, you know, give them the medical treatment that they need at that time. Um, so you're calling 911. You should also know that all emergency responders do carry Narcan. So let's say you have one Narcan or you have those two Narcan and that person is not responding to it, when emergency services um, does get to the scene, they also have Narcan on them. So if they need to administer more, they can. So you always want to make sure that you are calling 911 to make sure that a medical professional is on their way to treat this person. Ideally, you do not want to leave a person that is going through or experiencing um, an overdose. You want to stay by their side for any reason. If it is to get your phone or to do whatever, whatever you need to do, what you know, you're calling 911. You want to put the person in this recovery position. So you are late, you are putting the person on their side. Um, and as you can see on this on this screen, um, one hand is kind of next to their face. The other one is resting underneath it to support, to support their head. The reason for this position, if they are to, you know, come out of that overdose while you're away, you don't want them to choke. So you don't want them to, you know, choke on something that's in their mouth, choke on their tongue, anything like that. So you want to make sure that you, if you have to leave for any reason, that you are putting them on their side in this recovery position until you come back. Um, you are gonna give two rescue breaths and it's always important to mention, this is all in what you're comfortable with. And so we do these trainings with staff that are interested and we always let them know, you always have to kind of take care of yourself first. So if you are not comfortable with the rescue breaths, that is completely fine. Um, a lot of times people do prefer to have the face shield to kind of be a barrier. Um, it, but if you don't have that, the main thing is always going to be the Narcan. Um, but if you are comfortable, give those two rescue breaths. So you're going to place the person on their back, tilt their chin up to open up their airways. You're going to pinch the their nose and then you're going to give two rescue breaths. Um, blow enough air into their lungs to make their chest rise. So if, again, if you have taken a CPR course, it is the same thing. So tilting their head back, making sure the airway is open, pinching their nose, and then giving two rescue breaths. After you give the two rescue breaths, you're going to administer the Narcan. Again, we're focusing on that nasal spray. Um, Naloxone usually starts working within 30 to 45 seconds. So if that person, I would say a minute tops, like if you give that Narcan, that person is still not responding, you're going to move on to the next step. You don't, it's not going to take a long time for them to start responding. And you always want to make sure that you're acting quickly. So typically within a minute, a person will respond to that Narcan. Um, if Narcan is the you know appropriate response to whatever it is that they're experiencing. And then you're going to go back to the rescue breaths. Um, so again, putting them on their back, tilt their chin up, pinch their nose, and then give the two rescue breaths. 
Assess and respond. So most times people will recover after a single dose of naloxone is administered. I will say, I think the most that I've heard a person requiring is like five or, or six doses of Narcan. Again, because fentanyl is, of course, being sold all over the street. Um, and fentanyl is very, very potent. So sometimes a person may require one or two or more doses of Narcan. Um, so there are two cases in which you may need to administer a second dose. Situation A, if the person has not responded to that initial dose within three, scratch three minutes, I would not even say three minutes. If they have not responded within a minute, a minute and a half, you want to administer that second dose. So again, the box that you get if you are interested, um, and there will be a QR code, QR code at the end of the presentation if you do want um, Narcan sent to your house. You can fill out the 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 survey, and they will send it out. Yes, Janet. Quick question. So when they go to the health department or even uh, community services, how many boxes of Narcan can they receive? I'm just Ooh, thinking in instances where, you know, you may need to administer more than one just so mm -hmm. that you know what you should have on hand. Yeah. So most of the time they will give you the one box, but I don't think that they are holding the Narcan hostage. So if you share with them that you need more, even for some of our um, teachers that go through this training, some of them express interest in wanting more than one box because maybe they're a coach. They want to keep one in their car and one in the school. They have done it for us before where they will send they will send two boxes for that person that is requesting that. Typically, it's one. If you have a circumstance and you say, you know, I need more than one box, they are going to give you more than one box. I'm more familiar with the CSB because we are very close partners, partners. So I don't know what the health department really does, but I know the CSB is pretty good about giving it out. And if you express that you need more than that, they, you know, they are going to give you more. Thank you for that. That was a good question. Um, and then situation B, if the person has, they responded to the Narcan, but the person goes back into an overdose you will want to use the the you want to use that second dose of narcan so we'll go through each situation so like i said situation a they are not responding within a minute 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 and a half to that first initial dose of narcan you want to administer the second dose so wait wait a minute and a half if you have to push it two minutes um if there's no response they are probably not going to respond to that initial dose and you want to give that second one and then you're still giving the rescue breaths and you're always assessing and responding appropriately hopefully by this point if you call not call 911 by the time you have first you know discovered the overdose happening hopefully the emergency service the emergency responders have already gotten to the scene and they can kind of take over if not Again, give them that second dose of Narcan and then two rescue breaths and then assessing if they are respond if they have responded to that second dose. Situation B, the person has gone back into an overdose. So because of how opioids work in the brain, sometimes a person may respond to that initial dose um, and maybe it is effective for the first few minutes but then they go back into an overdose because there are so many um, opioids in the brain that they have attached back onto that opioid receptor, you will want to give that second dose. Um, so again, if they respond, it should last between 30 and 90 minutes. But in some cases, especially with the drug supply that is available on the street and is being laced with fentanyl, um, even before that 30 minutes, a person may fall back into an overdose and then you would want to go back to, you know, steps one through five. You're given the rescue breaths, you're administering the second dose, and then you are um, assessing and responding. I think I said given the rescue breaths. The aftercare of a person that has recovered or has, you know, that has responded to that Narcan, People fairly, they rarely, they get up and are upset. Um, I don't, 
I haven't really heard of situations where a person is violent or um, they are combative. If anything, they may be confused about what just happened. They may be anxious. Um, they could even be in psychological distress. But again, that's pretty rare. I think a lot of times they are more so confused about what just happened. Um, many times when people overdose, they don't realize what happened. Um, you can explain what has happened to them and emphasize the importance of waiting for emergency medical services to arrive. You are not going to make them stay there. So even if you, you know, they they respond to the Narcan, um, they may be confused. You're explaining what just happened. Um, if they do not want to stay and wait for medical services to arrive, you are not going to make them stay. So again, you want to make sure that you are always being so safe and you are looking out for yourself during this whole process. If they leave, then, you know, best of luck to them. But you do want to share that it's important for them to receive the medical attention that they need. These are the revive kits. So the last time I checked, there was a shortage on the revive kit. So the kit just has um, gloves. It has the face shield. It has an instruction card, like with the different steps on it. And it comes in a little carrying case. I think there has been a shortage for a few months now. Um, so even if you reach out to the, the local health department, or if you reach out to the CSB, I highly doubt that they're going to give you one of these kits. If they have them available, I'm sure that I'm sure they will. But I think they have not had them in a few months. Um, but they they always have Narcan available. So you may not get the kit with all the gloves, face shields and all of that, but they will give you the Narcan. And that is pretty much the end of the training. Um, this is, I think, is the evaluation. Actually, let me see. I am going to actually leave this slide up. If you are interested in receiving Narcan, if you want it mailed to your home or whatever the case may be, please contact Heather Martinson. Um, the, her and her team are the ones that do this work and they hand out the Narcan. They can mail it to your home. So please just reach out to her and let her know that you're interested and give her your address and they will get it mailed to you as soon as possible. But I appreciate you all for attending the session today and bearing with me as I got through this material because I've never done the Revive training before. So I do appreciate it. Um, and I will stay on if there are any questions and I'll turn it back over to Yannette. Are there any questions? Does anyone have any other questions um, for Ms. McKnight? I did place um, the survey link to tonight's session in the chat. If you would just take it, it's only a few questions. It, um, we would like your feedback for tonight's presentation and any future programming that you have. I will send the resources to you tomorrow that will include uh, the PowerPoint presentation you just saw, the video recording, and then I'll also include Ms. Martinton's information um, so that you can reach out directly to her uh, just, you know, to get um, information. So, uh, Mallory, something did come in the chat. And um, if uh, a parent has concerns about their child, not necessarily that they're using, but that may, you know, it could happen. What is it or what do you recommend that they do? So if there are concerns for a student, um, if that student is in high school, I would recommend either reaching out to the school counselor, school social worker, someone on that school-based mental health team. So that could include um, counselors, social workers, nurses, uh, or even an admin. In our high schools, through our partnership with community services, all of our high schools have um, New Horizons counselors. So New Horizons counselors work with students with, I think they do prevention work, but a lot of it is early intervention or, you know, young people that are a little bit further along. Um, they may be struggling with addiction or what have you. So again, there is one in every high school. So I would also recommend reaching out to that person 
if there are concerns about a high school student, you know, maybe experimenting with some type of substance or whatever, if this is not a high school student, always recommend the school counselor, school social worker, um, or an administrator. Um, and they a lot of times have resources that are in the community. Um, sometimes they will reach out to me about specific situations. And my email was also posted there if you're interested. And I can also put it in the chat. Um, if you have- I'll send it out tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yannette will send it out. But um, you can also reach out to me if you have any questions and I'm always happy to assist, but someone in that school, on that, that school based mental health team is always there to support students that may be struggling in this area. Do we have any other questions? All right. Well, at this time, I would just like to say thank you to Ms. McKnight. Um, this was a great presentation, really good information for all of us to really uh, know and be aware of. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And I invite you to go back to our Family Engagement uh, Series website. We do have other upcoming presentations coming, and the March offerings are already posted. Um, again, I'll send a follow-up email tomorrow with... Um, the resources for today and contact information should you need um, maybe Narcan to have on hand or, you know, you have additional questions for Ms. McKnight or Ms. Martinson. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.